I took Paul's lead in dividing chapter 2 into four parts, as I discussed with you before, by the word brethren. He used it four times, and I think strategically, like he often does as a marker, to break a thought on a subject matter. So we find it in the second chapter, verse 1, brethren, and we find it in 9, we find it in 14, and we find it in 17. Notice that? And we did a whole study on the word brethren uh, as a positional truth of salvation. When he speaks of brethren, he speaks of, speaks in the plurality uh, of the congregation. Uh, that would be after the idea of Galatians 3. There's neither male nor female, slave nor free, that type of thing. He calls them the brethren. Uh, it's a title, actually, if you recall. It's a title from the divine agency. God chooses a divine agency in every dispensation who are the custodians of the word of God in evangelism. And now the word brethren has come to the church age. And it's used for the divine agency of the church age, uh, the dispensation of the church. So we are in the, in the first eight verses uh, where Paul says, you yourself know. It's kind of an interesting to, way to say that, isn't it? I mean, that's what all of we pastors try to get our congregations to do, is you yourself know. Not so much that your pastor knows, but that you know. That's our whole idea of cycling the Word of God by faith. faith you know, the faith cycle. Bringing the Word of God from a place of hearing to believing to applying to completing it in your life. When you do, then you yourself know. You've now become a, 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 a person who is able to become knowledgeable of the will of God on your own understanding. For you yourself know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. And he's talking about evangelism of Acts 18 on a missionary uh, mission of the second missionary trip. And after we have already suffered the, as a missionary preaching the truth of the gospel and have been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you. In other words, people were threatening them for teaching it, and they went right on teaching it. Uh, we had the boldness of our God in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amidst much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God, and this is where our passage comes today, watch verse 4 and 5, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but pleasing God. Watch this now, who examines our hearts. For we, have never we, for we never came to you with flattering speech, as you know. Look how he's been pushing that idea. As you know, nor with a pretense for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, neither from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority but we proved to be gentle among you, that's because they were new converts, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children, having so fond an affection for you, as described in verse 7, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. Remember, they only got to stay three Sabbath days before they were booted out from there. In Thessalonica, they, they spent three Sabbaths, as we, as we read. And then they, they got under persecution for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they went on looking for another open door. 
what is wonderful, God opened the door to get them into Thessalonica. They preached the gospel and taught the believers basic milk doctrines of what it means to be saved. Persecution arose after three, three weeks with them. And for, they saw that as a door closing, and they moved on in evangelism to another city where God would open a door, they would evangelize, persecution and opposition would come, and they, they would leave. But listen, listen to me. Here's the power of the gospel of Christ. An open door came. They preached the gospel. People got converted. On their evangelism, the, go, the door got closed, and they moved on, right? But they left disciples of Jesus Christ. The power of the gospel to change people's life and they, and they established a church within that three weeks and left a pivot of, of believers with the Word of God. That's the power of evangelism, isn't it? And then they went, on, they went on to do it. And listen, they've been doing that. The first missionary trip, they did it. They would go in on an open door. Converts would come, they would get kicked out, closed door, they would move to another city, open door, get converts, closed door, they'd move on to another one without becoming discouraged. Isn't that wonderful? Because they knew their call. And the people they left understood their responsibilities to carry on the truth of the Word of God. So we've wound up in America. That's a marvelous concept, isn't it? What started in Jerusalem has spread all the way to Birmingham, Alabama. Because of faithful, faithful people who understand open and closed doors don't mean necessarily anything to anybody else but to you. God opens your door, you go in it, you do what God told you to do, he closes the door, you move on. But you leave those people that understand why they're there. God has planted them. He's planted a church. That's a marvelous thing. And who is responsible for that group of people? Do you know the answer to that? That group of people, when the guys got kicked out, who took responsibility? Who do you think? Who's the savior of the body of that group? Jesus Christ. Who's the, head of the, who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. Who's responsible for that church? Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful to know that? And that little group took responsibility, and that church has become a dynamic church. And we've talked about the dynamics of that little church. Uh, they, that little church took the word of God. Paul is long gone. And listen, carried the gospel across what we call Greece today. That little church of Thessalonica. Spread the gospel through Macedonia and Archaea. And Paul brags on them. Because the Lord brags on them. And here we are. We're no different. And here we are. And what is our responsibility? Same thing the church's responsibility. Teach the word of God and do evangelism. We're the custodians. We're the custodians. It's never about the number of people you have. It's about their spiritual growth. You know, people say to me, well, Ron, aren't you discouraged with the number of people? I mean, at one time, this church was booming with people. You had to get here early to get a seat. Are you not discouraged? No. Absolutely not. I've never been a guy on numbers. I'm looking, you know, I'm looking for quality. I'm looking for those who, who have... Who, the, where the word of God is making a change and a difference in their personal life. When that happens, you yourselves know. I've got such a church. I'm so thankful for you. 
I have a church who yourself know what the truth is. The Lord's taking pictures by, of me and not you. I want you to notice that. Well, Paul, this is a wonderful book to a young church uh, of just great encouragement. You think they're getting opposition? <laughs> Listen, the devil fights the gospel tooth, tooth and nail, whatever that is. I know what a tooth is. I know what a nail is, but I don't know how you put them together, what you have. Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful church, Thessalonica. In fact, Paul called it a model for other churches a modeled ministry to other churches and other areas. They went beyond their own city. They went beyond their own neighborhood. They went beyond their own family and carried the gospel to an entire region. Paul spent three weeks and they spent the rest of their lives carrying the message. That's because you're the savior of the body and the head of the church, not Paul, not Ron Adema. What a privilege it is to bother to teach those who know and know the responsibility they have with the word of God, first to themselves and to their friends and their neighbors and beyond. Encourage our hearts today, Father, with an understanding of how God examines our hearts. And we should be mindful of that in the way we think and behave. But we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, verses 4 and 5 is what we're after today with an idea that Paul talks to them about. God examines our hearts. Now think about that idea. God examines our hearts. Yeah, he says that, notice. Look at verse 4 and 5, which is really interesting. You're going to have to pay attention today. I'm going to have to use some Greek on you. For just as you have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Watch verse 5 now. Because he can examine our heart. He becomes a witness to our heart. Watch this. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with pretense for greed, as you know. God is, God is the witness. God is the witness. He's the witness of Paul's heart. He's the witness of their heart because he approves and examines our hearts. That's quite an idea. Last week, uh, we introduced the idea of how to divide the chapter, as I mentioned in my introduction. And this week, we're going to look at how and why God examines our hearts and becomes a witness of it. That's an interesting thing when we think of God being a witness. One who gives testimony to. You know, a witness is called to a stand, right? And here, God is, God is both the judge and the witness. That's just kind of an interesting idea that Paul has given us here. And so we're going to look at this idea, how and why God examines our hearts, and therefore is a witness to that. God is a witness to that in our life. Number one, I got four ideas today. Paul explains in our lesson text that the God who examines our heart is also our witness. He who examines, approves, and examines our hearts is also the witness. Now, 
Thank you, Deanna. Deanna became an usher, and that's wonderful. So here we are in verse in point one. God in First Thessalonians two four and five. Paul explains in our lesson that God, who examines our heart, it's also a witness of it. In other words, you may not take notes on it, but He does. But He's going to be called as a witness. Not that interesting. Who's going to call Him? God, He calls Himself. He is a witness. Whether or not he's been, listen to me now, you're not paying attention. That's all right. It's early. The one who approves is the one who examines, is the one who entrusts his will with. The one who approves is the one who examines and is the one who is God. God approves, God examines, and God entrusts his will with. You see that? Well, one more time. 1 Thessalonians 2 is 4. Just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examined, uh, who examines our heart. Verse 6, God is the witness. It is God who approves, God who examines, God who entrusts. What we trust? His will. It could be the gospel. It could be categorical doctrine in your life. Right? Depends on where your growth is, what he, what he entrusts to you. He can't entrust to you what you don't know. He entrusts to you what you do know. You yourselves know. That's what he holds accountable. That's what he witnesses to you about. That's his witness to you. I've examined your heart, and I'm going to witness what I've told you, and you know, and you believe. I'm, I'm calling a witness to you. I entrusted it to you. Why are you not doing it? Where are you in this process? I approved you. I examined you for approval. I entrusted you with my will. Why aren't you doing it? All right. <laughs> Let's go into your Bibles. If you didn't bring one, there's one in the pew. I want you to put your eyes on it. I want you to go to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Because, see, it's all about the will of God. You pray according to the will of God. You live according to the will of God. Everything's about the will of God. And the will of God comes from the Word of God. The Word of God takes you to the will of God. The will of God takes you to the work of God. That's, a, that's just a formula. Six, six. Are you in Ephesians 6.6? 6? Yes. <laughs> you actually don't have to answer me. It's just kind of a rhetorical. Um, but, but that's okay. 6.6. 6. Not by way of eye service, as men pleasers. See, he's, he, that's where he's been talking to us. In, Thessalon in Thessalonians, he said the same stuff. Not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves or servants of Christ, Doing the will of God from the heart. See, that's what this is all about over here in Thessalonica and to this group of believers. It's God approves, God examines, God entrusts. What's he entrust? The will of God. And where does he want the will of God? Not in your mind. He wants it in your heart. You see, what's in your mind can go in one ear and out the other. <laughs> if, you, if you came from a generation like mine, we used to say that. It didn't stop. It's supposed to stop someplace. <laughs> it goes in one ear and out the other. That's your mind. You, your mind is the hearing process and the understanding. Then you got to believe it for it to stick. What you believe now, you can apply. You can't apply what you don't believe because you don't know so Paul says, you yourselves know. What does that mean? It means they've heard it, they've understood it, and they believe it. Now we can apply it. God has entrusted you. Now you apply it. Applying and completing is, where, is, the, important, is the important part to the will of God being exercised in our life. You hear the word of God, you believe it. Now you walk it out in your life. You walk by faith. Where does faith come from? Hearing the word of God, believing the word of God. Now I walk it out. 
What are you walking out? The will of God. He's entrusted the will of God. Where did the will come from? It came from the word. The word to the will to the work. And then God brings his word to pass. Romans 4.21. What, what God has promised, he is able to perform. That, that's the completion part of the faith cycle. Boy, you've got to learn that. This is what Paul is talking about in exercise. Did he entrust you to do that? When you believe it, he entrusts you. Entrusting you with the will of God is for you to bring it into the application of your life, to the exercise of your volition compatible with the plan of God. I mean, how? listen to me. Here's a little test you can do for yourself, whether you yourself know. How much in your daily living, you ought to run a little, you know, I say this all the time, you don't do it, and that's your business, not mine. But you ought to run a journal for a week on your life. Run a journal for one week on your life. Do the morning, afternoon, and evening, and how much the Word of God plays a role in your life. And record it. Because, listen, you live, you walk by faith, not by sight. You walk in the power of the Spirit and not in the power of the flesh. You ought to pay attention. The only way you yourself know is to, is to examine your own heart. At some point in the maturity of your life, you've got to examine your heart. And you've got to learn to do that. You've got to be the first witness. You don't need God to be called as a witness against you not. I've entrusted you. Why, are you. why aren't you walking it out? Why are you not doing what I've asked you to do, what I've set and taught you to do? That's God's witness to you. And you ought to do it because what you will learn from that is how much dynamics does the Word of God. Listen, it's everything. And you ought to learn to do it under good, comfortable conditions, on the, on the blessing side rather than on the jamming, cursing side of your life when God has you under discipline because he's witnessing against entrusting you to something you're not doing. You understand? So what does he does? do? He does, he does listen, he does Hebrews 5, 11 through, uh, uh, let's see, Hebrews 12, 5 through... Uh, 11, what is that? He disciplines you. As how? As a loving father, an Abba father cares for his children. He's going to discipline you. Why? To bring you back to a place where he can entrust the word of God and the work of God in your life. Listen, your, God has for your life some work that nobody else could do that he's developed your entire life to where you are now in your late 20s, early 30s, early 40s, early 50s, wherever you are. God has walked your life to where you are. He, has, he, he is interested in taking your life where you are and bringing it into a dynamic ministry sphere of influence on people your life touch that nobody else could touch the way your life does. And you've had people in your life, maybe not spiritual, but who were authority figures and had a positive impact upon your life. I had many of them before I ever came to Christ. All of these God had put in my life as figureheads, positive role models to get me where I am today. I had Phyllis Breeding in the sixth grade that put in my heart that I could go to college. This little old farm boy out from Podunk Nowhere. I went home and told my grandparents, I'm going to college. And they went, oh, son. Don't get your hopes up too high. There's no way we can put you in college. Well, all the air went out of my balloon. 
So I went back to Phyllis Breening. I said, I really like the idea, but I can't go to college. Who told you you can't go to college, Phyllis Breening said to me. I said, my grandparents. And she said, well, I love your grandparents. They mean they can't send you, Ron. Yeah, that's what they said. That don't mean you can't go to college. I'm in the sixth grade. I said, well, <laughs> how's that going to work? <laughs> she said, you're going to send yourself. I said, how am I going to do that? She said, you're, you're just an average C student, Ron Adema. And that's not your potential, but you're satisfied with it. You want to go to college? Well, I'd like to. Bring your grades up to B's and A's before you leave me. I was in sixth grade. I'm going to leave her in eighth. I had one teacher in eight grades, one room in a schoolhouse. One schoolhouse, one room, one teacher, eight grades. That's the best education anybody could ever get because you got to repeat all your classes. Whatever he's weak in, you left strong in. Nobody, nobody complained because you all sat in the same room. Enlist the first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. And when you're eighth grade, you taught first graders, second graders, whatever you were strong in math. If you were strong in math, which I wasn't, you taught a long time. So, Phyllis Brainy says, you can go to college on your own, but you got to bridge grades up to A's and B's. And I did. Before I, when I graduated, Phil Sabrini got a hold of me. And she said, now you're going to high school. Yeah. You got to keep that same idea. Ron, when you go to high school, you got to be strong. You got to be strong A's and B's. You're going to go to college. Off from your, your grades. And so Phil Sabrini, before I left the eighth grade, we started writing to universities. I was writing to all kinds of universities, and they were responding to me in the eighth grade. They were sending me posters and, and all that stuff. My room was filled with the idea of going to college because of Phyllis Brainy. As I, as I went on in my high school, they became really interested in me. And they, by my junior year, they were offering me scholarships. They were all wanting me. Loyola and all these all these kind of schools that are in the north. When I graduated from high school, I went to college. I like to never got out, but I went to college. <laughs> went to college. I'm so appreciative of Philip Brini. A little old gal that came out to a country rural school and taught kids like me. And there were a lot of kids in my grade that went to college that never went to college ever. Nobody in their family ever went to college like mine. Because Phyllis Brainy. Send yourself to school, son. Hmm. No government money either. I worked and went to school and went on scholarships. All kinds of people. I could tell you, I, my, my list could go on before I came to Christ of people that God put in my life that were positive role models for me to bring me to Christ. Phyllis Brinney doesn't really understand that, but I, I wound up in Alabama and Birmingham because of her because I followed my educational path and I wound up at UAB dental school because Phyllis Brini put me on the path. We all have these people in our lives that are really positive role models that God has put there. My grandparents and all kinds of people in my life to bring me to the, 
to the big man to bring me to God Almighty, who is my Abba Father. And he said, all of that, Ron Adema, is to get you to where I want you to a place in your spiritual maturity where I can entrust you with the word of God, with the will of God to a group of people. I would have never believed that in a million years that God would so entrust me. And let me tell you, you'll never meet a pastor take it more serious than I do. I can tell you that. I am fearful what I tell you. God is my witness. <laughs> I am fearful what I tell you, how, how, how I would help direct your life. I want to be a positive role model, and I know God is my witness. I'm just telling you, I, I, I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking about you. What I have, everybody should have, in my opinion, not necessarily the pulpit, but the place in your life where God can entrust you with his, with his will. I mean, do you know what it is? I mean, start, start journal, journaling your life so that you can begin to see. You might know, listen, God, you, God is probably doing a lot more in your life than you even realize because it's become a commonplace, and that's a good thing. Sometimes you write it down, you go like, wow, I didn't realize that. I didn't write it. When you write it down, you go back and you look at it and say, you know, he's an awesome, mighty God. I, I, highly, I highly recommend it to you, but, you know, it's your choice. Now, I want to show you something that's really interesting. Paul, you know, is, there's no way you could see this in English. He uses the word approved and he used the word examine. Do you see that? I love it when you put your eyes on the Word of God. That shows me a love affair. You know, when you put your eyes on somebody you really like, you know what that means? That's a good thing, isn't it? It's the same Greek word. Isn't that interesting? The word approved and the word examined is the same Greek word, dokimazo. Now, you can't see that unless you're a Greek student. And you don't have to be a deep Greek student. You just have to have a year of it or sit under somebody who has a, has a little bit of it. The word examine is dokimazo. Dokimazo means to be examined for approval. I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to just use one illustration. Dokimazo means to be examined for approval for some specific service after testing for qualifications. An example would be a graduate law student passing the bar exam and is now qualified to practice law in that state. There's the two words together. Probably some of you have, have did that in your profession. Elridge, did you have to do that? Uh, did they, you have to go through a test when you moved from one place in medicine to another place in medicine? You had to go through a, a, a testing, and, and did you have to be certified by the state or a board of some sort? Right? So that's what you did. So you, you put yourself in a position through qualifications to be able to do that, then you have to be approved to practice it. That's doki manzo on the examination side and the approval side. That's doki manzo. That's doki manzo. It's really strange how often you have to do it. In the state of Alabama, you don't have to do it to be a preacher. You don't even have to own a Bible. <laughs> yeah, there are no qualifications. Just set up a shingle. 
which I, you know, it's none of my business. You can do it one way or the other. I don't care. Uh, but our state is very lax in that area where it's not in other areas of professions. When we read the second chapter 4 and 5, and it says, just as, watch this now, you might circle that. You got a pencil? There should be one in the pew. I, put an, I underlined it. You might circle it, but I want to emphasize it. And then go all the way over to the word so, and they're connected. Just as so. Just as so. Just as you have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but so, but God who examines our heart. See, he connected dokimazo, approved and examined. He did it with just, just as so. Right? Just as so. And then he, he says, God is my witness, or God is our witness. Therefore, I put a, I put a couple places for you to write in. Approved by God for what service to others in our passage? The gospel. What kind of a gospel? Well, a grace gospel. Who examines our heart in this service? Who examines our heart? God. See how easy God's tests are? We could all go to college, can't we? Is that how easy it is? And so I remind you from last week, be sure you know what the gospel is. When you read 1 Corinthians 5, pay, pay attention now, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, pay attention to the word which. It's used five times for emphasis. And when you study it, you'll find that every time the word is which, every time the word which, <laughs> don't say that real fast, they'll put you in jail. It refers to the gospel. It refers to the gospel. You got that? All right. So what is the gospel? Here it is. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. You don't have a gospel without it. You don't have a gospel without it. Christ dies for your sins, he's buried, he's raised from the dead. There's your gospel. You can't leave any of that out. He's raised on the third day even. Can't leave that out. Raised on the third day. Be why is that? Well, listen, because the gospel is so important because that's the only way you're born again. That's the only way you get saved, that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. When you believe that, you are saved, Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. God doesn't ask you to quit sinning in order to be saved because you don't have the power. It's only after you get saved he can ask you to do that because now you have the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. You can walk in the Spirit and not walk in the flesh. If you walk in the flesh, you, you, you will produ it produces personal sin. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. How are people saved? By believing. What do I do? I believe the gospel. I've told you the story it's for many of you, but I got a call one morning about 3 or three o'clock in the morning from a guy I had witnessed to that early in his life had threatened me with a shotgun on his front porch that if I ever came back again, he would shoot me. And listen, I was pastoring in a community where they might do that. Just saying, they might have done that. And nobody would ever know that I was up there or something. I don't know. And I went, you'll not have to do that again to me, buddy. I've told you what I came to tell you. You won't have to threaten me again. I'm married and got a couple kids. You don't want to hear it. You won't hear it from me again. But you will hear it again, but it won't be from me. I got a call one night about 3 o'clock in the morning from his wife who had gotten saved about two weeks earlier from that in church. I got her going to church. And she called me, and she's, she's hollering on the other side of the phone. 
it, but it was a happy hollering. You know, really excited, like, but I didn't know what it was all about. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. Pastors don't like calls at 3 o'clock in the morning. Nobody does, right? These are not good calls as a rule. It, nobody ever told me at 3 o'clock in the morning I just won $1,000 or 10000 <laughs> It was never a good call. I said, she says, I'm, this is Carol, and I'm crying and hollering. I will what? Calm down on what's going on. She said, my husband just got saved. I said, You're, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Your husband just got saved? Yeah. He, he had been in an automobile wreck a couple of years prior to that. It was just a mess. That's how I got to know him. I went to the hospital and visited to him. He couldn't get out of bed. He threatened me then, but couldn't get out of bed. When he came home, I went back and talked to him, and then he brought a shotgun on me. And he said, he just got saved. I said, well, how, how did he just get saved? He said, he was in the bathtub. I thought, well, this is first. He was washing it off, and he, and he said, he said, will the blood of Christ do that for me? Will the blood of Christ do that for me? She said, yes, I believe it. And he said, well, I want it. I accept the work of Christ for my life. She called me. She said, get over here and get over here right now. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm dressing. James going, what's going on? Uh, go back to sleep, honey. I got a, I got a house call. Three o'clock in the morning. That's yeah, a good one, though. And I explained to her. And uh, what a wonderful thing. <laughs> what, a, what a life was changed. And we never left that house until about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning because people on the way to work, the news, every time every, anybody got up, people started coming at 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock and 8 o'clock. We cooked so many eggs. We fed so many people, and everybody in the community was so excited. Isn't that wonderful? What a celebration. You know why? Because God, God, God entrusts the gospel with us. And the gospel does the work of salvation. I don't. He just entrusts me to share it. I just go tell it. You know, go tell it on the mountain. I did. And God does the work. Can we not be faithful just to share the gospel? We've been entrusted with it. Share it and let it do the work. Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. If you'll believe it, you'll be saved today. Right where you sat. You can be saved in a bathtub, on a commode, or sitting in a pew. But you got to believe it. you got to believe it for your salvation. And when you do, God will be your witness from this day forever, for all eternity. God will always be your witness when you're called and say, so-and-so has done such and such, he said, but the blood of Christ covered it. So-and-so did such a thing, but the blood of Christ covered it. I'm so thankful the blood covered Ron Adama. I don't care who's called. There could be a lot of witnesses called against me. Yeah, that's for sure. God is there as my witness. The blood of Christ has covered him. His name is in the book of life. The blood of Christ has covered Ron Adam. But don't, I don't care what you bring up on me. I'm going to tell you the blood of Christ. Yes, I was a jerk. I, I'll confess that. I, I, I was a jerk. But I'm going to tell you the blood of Christ covered that. This is a marvelous idea that Paul has presented to us. Just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. It is God who examines our heart, and it is God who is brought to our witness. There are other things there under point one you ought to look at, and I'm going to leave it to your discretion for you to know for yourself. It's a big deal, point two, for a believer to be entrusted. Isn't this an interesting word? What's this word? Pastuo. Do you know what pastuo means? It's a verb meaning to believe. It means, pastuo means to believe or to trust. Trust and obey. 
for there's no other way. That's belief. There it is. It is the word pastuo. Paul used it as, as entrusted and okay. It's an aorist passive infinitive. It means to believe or to be entrusted. Paul is such a masterful writer. And so he says, look, because you're saved, God wants to approve you, wants to examine you, and wants to entrust to you the gospel. Listen, the gospel is such a big deal. Nobody can be saved without it. And salvation is the dynamics of the entire plan of God is the gospel. Everything works off from the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's everything. You have no church without it. You have no Bible without it. You have no purpose in life without it. Everything boils down to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a big deal. Entrusted with the grace gospel for other people's salvation. We're entrusted with the gospel for other people's salvation. My, my, my. I tell you, when that struck my soul way back many years ago, when my pastor took me through 1 Corinthians 15 and pounded that absolute in my soul, I went, wow. I need to always be sure that I've got a clear gospel and a message of grace salvation. We have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel of other people's salvation. You know what's important about an infinitive? That is true in English as well as Greek. But the aorist isn't. There's, no, there's nothing in other people's languages like an aorist. It's, it's unique to the Greek language. A point in time divorced from time. But the infinitive, an infinitive is not a mood. You know, there's a tense, a voice, and a mood in the Greek language. It's not a mood. It's a verbal noun. It can be used verbally. It can be used as a noun. It's a very unique thing. It's, it does in English, too. But if This is an infinitive. An infinitive is used to express the aim of the action of the main verb. We call it a verbal noun. It acts off the subject and the verb. This infinitive is used to express the aim of the action of the main verb. You know what the main verb was? Being approved by God. It's a perfect passive indicative. The indicative makes it a main verb. We call it a finite verb. I know that's a lot to digest. But that's the way Paul wrote it. This means to be entrusted with a grace gospel. Listen to me now. Here's what Paul is saying. To be entrusted with a grace gospel is God's aim after having you approved and examined in order to be entrusted. God is going to approve you, examine you, and then entrust you. The whole aim of approving you and, 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 and examine you, qualifying you for him to give you the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's the aim, the whole aim of it. That's the service, that's the primary service of the Christian life is the salvation of other people. That's your primary purpose. It's mine. It's my primary purpose, as well as teaching. It's the primary purpose of us all. There's nobody in here without it. And what's interesting is when Paul laid the main verb out, he made it a perfect passive indicative. The perfect tense means completed, and the past results, it always remains completed. This approval, once God approves you and examines you and entrusts you, he turns you loose with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
it's a pretty powerful idea. Point number three. The essence of God, because God approves me, God is my witness, right? God entrusts me. The essence of God is important in being approved and entrusted with the grace gospel in the plan of God. Approved and examined falls upon the essence of God. It is important to remember the role the essence of God plays in the fulfillment of the directive will of God in your life. You could not hear the essence of God enough in your life because everything that you do according to the will of God is fulfilled by the essence of God working dynamically in your life. For example, in Ephesians 6, 6, not by way of eye service, but men pleaser, as, by, as men pleasers, but as slaves or servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. And God is my witness. And God is my witness out of the essence or the character of God. For example, he, and I gave you scriptures that you can look at later. He's omniscient. God is all-knowing. That's how he can examine your heart. How can God examine every person's heart everywhere in the world under all different kinds of languages and educations and everything else that goes? Because God is all-wise. He's all-knowing. He drops only part of that to the Word of God. Just a part of the essence of God is dropped down here into the Word of God, and he calls it wisdom. Wisdom is just a small part of the, of, of the uh, uh, omniscience of God. It just deals with man. Doesn't deal with the stars and the universe and climate change and all that. <laughs> Did you know that? The omnipotence of God. See, omniscience is very important for us in examination. God can examine the heart. What's the rule? What's the, what rule does he use? Omniscience. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. Veracity and mutability plays a role in God examining our heart. Veracity, God is always, always building off from truth that is absolute. Absolute truth. God will never lie to you. He can't because of veracity. Always going to be truthful with you, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Sometimes you just don't want to go to him anymore because you know what he's going to tell you. Right? How long has it been since you prayed to God? Oh, it's been years. Why? Uh, I'll tell you, if you study it all down, it's because you didn't like the answers you were getting. Or you knew the answers you were going to get. Huh? Immutability. Immutability, this is a key in this examining our hearts. Immutability. Listen, the character of God's never going to change. He doesn't go with the wind. He does, he does, he, you can't go like, well, boy, if you had been in my shoes, you wouldn't have feet if it wasn't for me. What are you talking about, shoes? <laughs> That's that conversation with God gets kind of crazy. You understand? Know Walk in my shoes. It wasn't for me, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't need a pair of shoes, you dummy. Sovereignty, the sovereignty of God. What a wonderful idea this is, the sovereignty of God. When it comes out, that everything about God to you is his will. I want you to do my will. What backs it? What backs the will of God? When he entrusts to me some aspect of the will of God, who backs it? The sovereignty of God backs it. The sovereignty of God. Walk by faith, not by sight. It's easier by sight, but I'm asking you to walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. 
How am I going to do it? Sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. I will it in your life. I will bring it to pass. That's Roman, listen, that's Romans 4.21. The righteousness of God, the love of God, the love of God should dominate our life. We talk a lot about love and don't talk about the other aspects of God. And that's okay. But the love of God, what motivates me to talk to people? The love of God. I want them, not the love of God I have for them, but the love of God that he has for them. The moment they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 5, the love of God is poured out within their hearts. The love of God. How wonderful that is. They now get to experience that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to whoever believed in him. The moment they believe, they experience that love of God in their hearts. Boy, was that an eye-opener for me, Gary? Was that ever an eye-opener for me? And, that, and the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit takes precedence in your life and salvation, he, he cries out in your heart that God is your father. He's your daddy. He will always be your daddy. There will never be a day in your life from the day of birth to the day of death and beyond that God is not your daddy. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. He gave it to you as a gift in salvation. God is your Abba Father. What a wonderful idea that is. Galatians 4, 7. Let's see. I'm going to have to quit here in a minute. Let me show you. When you study the Bible, you can see God examine people's heart all over the place. And sometimes God talks about it and gives us clues of how it works with the human pe person. The prophet Samuel was sent by God to the house of Jesse to select the next king of Israel in place of King Saul. You know the story, many of you. Lord said to Samuel, because Samuel's looking at all the boys that Jesse has. Tall ones, good-looking ones, smart ones. And he's looked at all of them. And the Lord said to Samuel, uh, or, uh, is, the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or the height or the stature, because I have rejected him. Because that's how he was looking. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Remember that? Looks at the heart. You're looking. See, you're walking by sight to do my will. You got to walk by faith. You got to let me tell you who. You think you, see, he already had somebody. He said, that, I got one, Lord. Oh, he's handsome. He's smart. He's tall. He's taller than most people in Israel. He'll be able to stand above the crowd. He, he looks, I mean, he's just, oh, I, you know, if I had to have a son, that's who I'd want. Lord went, no, I don't want him. And he went through all the kids, all the sons, the same way, and he went, I just hate your standard. Listen, I didn't call you to do that. And so he has a, God has to have a moment with the, the examiner, <laughs> right? He has to have a talk with the examiner. Look, you're, you're. And listen, this is the talk he's having with you today. The Lord looks at the heart. You girls ought to pay attention to that. You, you pick Fruit Loops. Then, then, then you get hungry all the time because fruit, fruit, fruit loops don't last very long. The first thing you know, your life's a mess because you look at the outer and not the inner. Nah, I'm just saying. Meddling now, ain't I, huh? Meddling a little bit. Samuel says to Saul, the one that's being rejected, the Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. Saul, you're not a man after my own heart. 
There was a time you were, and there's a time now that you're not. I'm going to have to put you on the bench, son. I'm going to put you on the bench. You can't play anymore. You're still a member of the team, but you're not going to be a starter. In fact, you're going to ride the bench the rest of your life. Your life. Yeah. I'm looking for a man after my own heart. The Lord has sought for himself a man after whose heart? Wait a minute. After whose heart? After God's heart. See, God wants, see, God has a heart. And he wants your heart and his heart to be in tune. And it's all about his will. See, that story, it's all about his will. He gives you, he, get, he pours out his heart, he gives you his will. He wants you to pour your heart out to that same will that he ain't going to entrust you with. That's a big deal. That may not sound like a big deal to you, but it's a big deal. That is a big deal. You're going to have to think on it, maybe sleep on it tonight to get it, but that's a big deal. And the Lord has appointed him ruler over his people because you have not kept what? The Lord, I, my typing got crazy. What the Lord commanded you. And then I dealt with, and I'm not, I'm not going to go to it because it would be a whole study in itself, the heart being a, a major part of your soul. And it, it, I want you to study that on your own. I want you to study it on your own. And I gave you a little bit, I think there are like uh, seven important points that you ought to pay attention to. Okay? Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then Rick will pledge us out of here. Father, we're so thankful today, these who have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. Father, we should be wide open to say to you, examine our hearts. I, I, knowing I can't hide a thing from you. And therefore, the things I would try to hide from you, yeah, I got to acknowledge that are not beneficial and healthy for me. I've got to replace them with the will of God. I've got to be open to the will of God. I pray, Father, that all of us walk away from today and would be open to say, examine my heart, Father, and find me approved and worthy to be entrusted with the work that you have assigned for me. May my heart be open to it. May my heart be open to the work you've assigned for me. I mean, some of the work I know what I am. I'm a father and I'm a husband. I'm a worker. I have a job. What else? What else, Father? I don't want to limit my life or you. What else do you want to examine my heart for, for ministry? I never look at my plate as full, but ready. I always want to be ready. It's up to you to determine what you want to be on my plate. My plate should always be full. It's how you want to adjust it. Examine our hearts, Father. Examine our hearts so that our hearts can be one with you. In Jesus' name, amen.